Welcome to Agile to Agility Podcast with Milan Bayic. Major show alert. The very first value we wrote is individuals and interactions. Let's take this to another level. I like to pull in practices wherever I find them. So I'm not like, you know, just a scrum guy. I'm the one that's always saying things like, don't pay attention to the scrum guide. I mean, do what's right for you. And, you know, whether it's scrum or not, who cares? As long as you're making making good teams and good products. How did Scrum Alliance come about? It's an interesting story and it's gets somewhat lost to the sands of time as people have kind of selective memory about it, but mine's pretty good on this and actually dug up some of the old uh, emails on this. The Scrum Alliance is actually not started by Ken or myself. We Neither of us were involved at the absolute beginning. It was started by a guy named Brian Zarnett. I believe he is now a karate instructor in Toronto. He didn't hang around Scrum for very well. Um, and he started it as a program within the Agile Alliance. And Ken and I were both involved. We were on the board of the Agile Alliance at the time. This would have been um, 2002. And um, I was running what was called the, uh, the programs program, which was to encourage new programs to form. And one of the programs was to put on a conference one was to find the best Agile articles. There weren't very many right back then. You couldn't Google them. And um, we had, Brian wanted to start a Scrum program within there. He called it the Scrum Alliance. And um, I think, you know, within like a day of starting it, he asked Ken and I, to, Ken and me to get involved, right? So, you know, we were not there the, the minute it started, but a day or a couple of days later. And so we got involved. Um, Esther got involved probably about um, six to nine months later. Um, okay into this i could be wrong on that but it was definitely months six six months to a year somewhere in that range later because we'd already been going a little bit and what happened is we started within the agile alliance and then ken wanted to start the certification program in may of um, 2003 he also had visions of hey we might do a scrum conference someday we had no idea we called a gathering or anything like that but he was like you know we might do something and that created a problem for us because now we were going to have a problem in that we were going to be taking money in. And it wasn't about making money, but, you know, you know, charge people a hundred dollars to go to a conference, spend all the money. You know, it was, it was never meant to make money. It was, but as a program within the Agile Alliance, we were going to take money and spend it on events. And we couldn't set up a bank account because we weren't a legal entity, right? We're a little division of something else, right? And so we had to spin it out of the Agile Alliance. And that's when we started it as kind of the, the, what everybody knows today is the Scrum Alliance is a standalone entity. And what um, was so the discussion? Yeah. So what was the discussion around, like, you know, uh, starting as a nonprofit and the way that you did and uh, how was that? And somebody, uh, I think it was Tom Meller uh, that told me that you were the actually person that incorporated the company. Is that true? Like, what, uh, how, what was close. the discussion? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretty close. It technically, it was my wife. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, my wife is the founder of the Scrum Alliance. Um, my, um, I, I hate paperwork. I hate any paperwork. And um, uh, my wife, it's kind of our deal is she'll do it for me because otherwise she knows I'll never do paperwork. Like I remember early in our marriage, we'd have to get reimbursed for medical expenses. Back then, you know, you'd pay the insurance company would pay you back if you overpaid your deductibles. And I was just like, it's not worth the money for me. You know, it's $50. You do it. And so my wife does all the paperwork. So she technically incorporated us. Now, the reason we actually started as a for-profit corporation, um, and that's because um, I think Ken and I are, are very similar in this way. We're both um, what I call the, the right amount of lazy, um, you know, <laughs> where we, we just don't want a lot of extra work. We don't want to deal with a bunch of paperwork, a bunch, bunch of crap, right? right? And so our goal was to be a, a for-profit corporation that didn't make any money, right? We didn't want to make any money from this. It was, we both had our own businesses. We're making money from our businesses, not great livings back then, but we had our own businesses and the Scrum Alliance was meant to be a thing to, um, kind of pr spread credibility to others. That's kind of how we started it. We talked about being a credibility transfer organization. And um, we were funding it basically ourselves. Um, and Ken in particular, I mean, Ken put a lot of money into just hosting events and things like that. He would donate, just do this. He's a very generous guy. And um, how much did you put in? Um, I'm not, I mean, he would put in a couple of thousand dollars to like, you know, start the, the very first, um, you know, if we go way back in history, you, know, you get the Agile Alliance, and there's people in it, but no, nobody's paying any money into it. They're just joining. Yeah. 
and you want to put on an event and um you know the hotel wants a deposit <laughs> it's mm-hmm. like okay we're an organization that doesn't have any money we're going to charge people you know maybe 500 dollars to come to the event but we don't have it now right and mm-hmm. so ken would fund those type of things i don't remember how much i did but i did some um and but a lot of it was ken i think alistair coburn pitched in some on that um but yeah. you know it's, it's a new organization it's got to get bootstrapped right and so yeah. they were funding those things so ken and i started this from launch with no intention of making money um we just didn't want to do the paperwork, right? It's more hassle to be a nonprofit, right? You got to prove you're not making a profit, all this other stuff. And it's like, we're the right amount of lazy. We didn't want to do that. So we said, we're going to be a for-profit that does, doesn't make any money. You know, end of the year, we're going to make $87 and we'll pay taxes on $87, right? And it's yeah. nice and easy, nothing big hassle. And um, we um, ran that way for, I'm going to guess like a year and a half, maybe two years. Um, and then switched to a to a nonprofit. Nonprofit. Yeah. Why, why did you switch? Like, was it just the, it was growing, or like, what was the reason for switching to nonprofit? I, I think Ken and I would have kept it as a for profit corporation. Mm-hmm. We we would have just continued again. That little bit of lazy, like you know, it's already incorporated. Why change it? Mm-hmm. Um, I think we would have continued. Um, what happened is a couple of the a, a fair number of the trainers. Um, we're pushing to make it a nonprofit. Um, and I think that was the right answer. I wasn't, I didn't really care. Um, but some of the terms were pushing to make it a, a nonprofit. And I think part of it was that it was starting to see some money come in. Trainers were paying $50 a person they trained and that was funding it. And Ken and I were still putting money in the organization to keep it going in the early days, but um, it was starting to get some money coming in. And I think trainers, I'm guessing at this, might have started to see, wow, this thing's going to make money someday. I'm not sure I trust those those guys to, you know, and that was probably wise because I don't know if I would have trusted myself at the point where the scrum wants, you know, where they're training, you know, tens or a hundred thousand people a year. I don't know that I would have trusted myself to not, not say, oh, I need a salary from this or something. So yeah, pushed by the trainers. I think it was good. I wouldn't have done it on my own, just out of laziness though. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the conferences earlier and uh, in 2000, Seven, I believe you guys had like, you know, less than 50 people, I think maybe 30 and people are already complaining how big <laughs> it was. Could you talk about maybe a little bit uh, about those early conferences and uh, uh, what was going on? And uh... yeah, the very first one was hosted by um, Boris Gloger, who was one of the early certified scrum trainers. And I think it was in Austria, it might have been Germany, but somewhere in that area. Yeah. And um, it was very small, was, you know, that, and Ken liked the idea, and Boris had come up with the name Gathering. And so Ken liked the idea, wanted to put more events on. Um, and this is where my wife did it again. She she contracted with the first hotel that we really did like a, a formal gathering. It was in Boulder, Boulder Colorado. And um, the Boulder Auto Hotel there, which is like very fundamental to the history of Scrum, we've had a lot of events there. And it has one big room that um, we could set people into. And we like to end the gatherings with everybody in a big circle, right? One big circle around the room. And everybody would say, I don't remember exactly what it was, but Esther Derby, Diana Larson would facilitate this and, you know, say something like you appreciated about the, the, the gathering or something, you know, one of those type of debriefs at the very end. And um, it was a year or two later, all of a sudden we had to have two circles, right? We wouldn't fit in one circle around the room. And there started to be a huge amount of uproar. We can't ever get bigger. It has to stay this size. And I remember Ken and I talking about it. It's like, that's not an option, right? I mean, you know, I don't know how you would do a 50 person event in the scrum world. You know, what would you charge people? You know, you'd have to charge or have it be a lottery who gets in or something. And that just, that doesn't feel any better, right? And so a lot of people wanted to keep that intimate feeling, but you you can't be you can't do that if you're going to really create a, a bigger movement. So we started to realize we had to get into to bigger events. We just you know because there enough there was enough demand. The early ones were invitation only. You couldn't register. You had to be invited to to attend. To, to attend, yeah, yeah. But that's so cool. Uh, I, uh, I even heard like I think it was in two thousand eight. Uh, uh, there was it was in Portland, I believe, and, and then there was even like a fist fight about. I don't know if you remember that, but it's just it's interesting. Uh, then they the, 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 it was the night before, and then during the uh, gathering, uh, there was some guy that uh, I think either Ken or somebody hired uh, as a bodyguard or security. Oh. 
Uh, Jesse. Is that true? Yeah. yeah, that's true. Um, that happened. Um, he, I think he had the bodyguard at Portland, but it happened because of some things at a prior gathering. Okay. Um, and I, my memory could be a little wrong on this, but that had to do with when the, the push to move from being a nonprofit to a profit. Um, and people were mad and, you know, yelling about that. And um, I remember somebody being very vocal and aggressive in, in criticizing Ken. And um, I had, um, I always have like a couple hundred dollars with me just, it, you know, I've, I have weird credit card issues, like my credit card will get declined buying a car wash or whatever. So I normally have like a couple hundred dollars just in the corner of my wallet type of thing. And so I remember going, pulling that out and go over to the person and go, here's your refund for the event, go home. Um, um, because the person was just being super disruptive at the event and attacking Ken, criticizing all of this. And um, after that, Ken decided he needed a bodyguard. I think that was a bit of an overreaction. Um, <laughs> it was kind of fun because uh, um, Jesse was the name of his bodyguard, and Jesse kind of went everywhere with him for, it wasn't very long, but maybe a year at the most, but I think it was more in, in the terms of months. So, yeah. What was your experience with uh, working with Ken? Ken's, Ken was always a lot of fun to work with. He um, very passionate about scrum, um, willing to, I think he was one of those athletes that just collapses at the end of the game, right? You know, he's just like, yeah. I think like Michael Jordan playing basketball with the flu and still winning the game and stuff, right? And then just, you know, being dead afterwards. And Ken was always very much that way. He'd kind of leave it all on the court, you know, give it everything he had. Um, so I had a lot of respect for him that way. Um, just kind of, I mean, two kind of fun stories from the early days with him is that Ken just never met a schedule he could stick with. Right? <laughs> and so he and I would co-train quite a bit. We co-trained the very first CSM. We co-trained the very first CSPO course. And many times in between, they're probably co-trained, I'm going to guess, 30 or 40 times. And um, he'd have an agenda. Like, you know, we want to be here by 10. We want to be here by 11 o'clock. And he would just decide he wanted to spend an extra three hours on, you know, why the scrum minister can't also be the product owner. It's like, okay, great topic, but you just spent three hours on it. Now, how do I get the afternoon back on schedule? So um, great guy. And he could lecture for three hours on any topic, but um, just really, really never met a schedule that he liked. Is it true um, that he had like uh, 250 slides and he would just go through them? Like how, what was his training style? Like how do you... <laughs> I, I want to make sure I'm, everything that I'm saying is with, is with love for Ken and it's just fun memories Absolutely. of the stuff. We, yeah, exactly. when, when we all have our own weird things, I could point out some about me, but um, he also is the only guy in the world that loves the Comic Sans, Comic Sans font, right? Yeah. So he had slides that were in Comic Sans and for some reason they were portrait mode instead of landscape mode. So he'd be on a landscape mode screen with portrait mode slides which i guess it's nice because they print but that's what his slides were like no graphics just text up there he was not a read the slides guy at all so not at all that's not his training style um yeah. again very engaging trainer but he'd have a slide up there he wouldn't even look at it. he might be on one slide literally for an hour um yeah. just telling stories about whatever the point is and yeah. um then he would jump 30 or 40 slides ahead so he, he didn't have a huge yeah. slide deck that i recall but yeah. um he had lots of different slides where he could tell different stories. So he might be on this yeah. slide for a half hour, jump 30 slides, stay on the next slide for an hour, yeah. jump 30 yeah. slides. So he used the slides more as like, what do I want on the screen while I'm talking? Um, exactly. It was not yeah. ever, it's not a crutch. That's not his style where he needs the slide as a crutch or a reminder. Yeah. It was more, yeah. oh yeah, now I'm supposed to talk about the product owner. And he'd talk about the product owner. And it would relate to what was in the next 30 slides, but he was not fast forwarding through slides. That's, yeah. that was never his style. So. Cool. Yeah, just it's uh, and you hear these stories and like you know I uh, I wish and I'm gonna reach out to uh, Ken as well and see you know if he's open. I know he's had some uh, health issues, but uh, I would love to talk to him and Jeff as well. Um, so maybe let's uh, shift gears a little bit. Uh, I asked earlier um, about you know what was uh, what was Jeff in all of this? I know you all had your own companies and. Uh, uh, what was he involved? Like just in, as far as like checking in with you guys or what was the, what was that type of, what was your relationship with Jeff? Jeff wasn't involved in the early days of the Scrum Alliance, very early in Scrum, right? You know, mm -hmm. first guy to really talk about Scrum and some of the 
old uh, Usenet forums is where he was first posting about it. Um, but he wasn't really involved in the Scrum Alliance um, because he was he was kind of late to the game as a as an independent trainer. He was working uh, I don't know if it was CTO or VP, but he was working with a company called Patient Keeper. Um, I think was was that the company? I might be wrong on the name of the company. Um, but he was he was running um, a company as their their CTO essentially. And so he was not um, he was not out there like training different companies. And so he wasn't as involved in that way. He wasn't involved in founding the Alliance or creating their courses or anything like that. So. You have written, I believe, seven books starting back in 96 mm -hmm. or something like that. How did you get into writing? And uh, what, what used to, um, uh, yeah, I was a, um, my background as a programmer. I was a C++ programmer and I, um, I would post a lot on one of the Usenet forums, helping people with, you know, how do I do this in C++, how do I do this? And so I just answered a lot of questions and they're just, you know, like you might spend time on social media today, comp.lang.c++ was the, the Usenet forum on C++ and I, I helped, um, I enjoyed it. And um, a book publisher noticed me posting a lot and said, hey, I have an author who just bombed out on his book. He was supposed to meet a deadline, hasn't, you know, he's written like four pages. Do you want to take over the book? And um, it was a topic I was interested in, which was about database development using C. And so um, I was asked to take over that book, um, did that. And then I was um, fairly early, it would have been 95, I was fairly early in the Java beta program. And um, same publisher said, you know, we want to come out with some books on Java. Can you do some of those? And so I did. Uh, three Java books in like yeah. 95 through 97 early days, early days of Java. Yeah. What is your process? How do you write? Like, do you have a, you know, some people uh, have a specific time of the day. What's your process for writing? I, um, I tend to, I tend to outline the book kind of one level down. I'll list, I definitely list the chapters. I just have an outline yeah. with the chapters and then I list the main points that I want to do in the chapter. Um, and then often I kind of start in the middle of the chapter and I'll just kind of write what I want to want to say in the middle, because for me, the hardest part is the introduction story into the chapter. How do I get into the topic? And so I tend to try to write part of the topic and then I back up and do the, do the beginning for my books. What I've done, um, is I've always worked in this very much, um, uh, very much the Pomodoro approach now. And I remember talking to, I think it was Francesco Cirillo who came up with that. And he and I were doing something very similar. I mean, he totally invented Pomodoro, but I was doing something identical because I'd read a book about writer's block, which I don't really suffer from, but I worry, yeah. oh no, I'm not going to be able to do it. And so I was doing essentially a Pomodoro type of technique right around when he came up with that, because I would, um, I have a glass timer. I've got one here somewhere in my office. Yep, it's right over there. I've got a um, like a sand timer and it's a 30 minute timer. And I turn the sand timer over. And while the timer's running, I write. And my promise to myself is I will not stop. I won't check social media. I won't get bored and go get something to drink. I'll just keep writing for 30 minutes. If it's junk, I'll throw it away. Um, I don't have to keep it, but I'm going to stay focused for 30 minutes. Then what I like to do is I like to turn the timer over. This works a little bit different from a Pomodoro. If I'm on a roll, I'll just turn the timer over and, and keep going for maybe two hours. But yeah. if I feel like I've worked for the 30 minutes and I want to break, check my email, make a call, something like that, I'll stop the timer and do whatever I need to. And then I'll start another one. And I would just try to run a, I just called them sprints, of course, right? Yeah. Um, I would just try to do those writing sprints, um, you know, trying to get like five or six a day um, in when I was really focused on a book. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. And in the sense, you, you make a commitment to yourself. You don't do it. If you turn that, <laughs> off, yeah. you, you make a commitment. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I know you uh, stopped traveling some years ago. At least I know I've reached out to you. I tried to get you to, uh, to come to, uh, I think, Maine once and uh, to Europe, to Serbia. And uh, obviously now um, COVID has changed the game. Um, and how, uh, in many different aspects, in, in our personal lives, obviously in work environment, how has mm -hmm. COVID uh, impacted you and what you can do uh, both, uh, you know, personally as well as, uh, you know, professionally? 
Well, I still travel, not now, but I mean, up until COVID hit, I still was traveling some. I just was kind of cut back. And what I was doing is kind of cutting maybe like two trips a year, just kind of winding my schedule down instead of being on the road 30 weeks a year. Let's go to 28 to 26 to 24. So just kind of going yeah. down. And what I'd learned with travel a long time ago was that I had this, I had this theory that I had to travel to different cities because, you know, somebody would want me in uh, uh, Minneapolis, right? Um, but then I couldn't come back to Minneapolis until demand had built back up. And what I learned is I was better off going to a smaller set of cities more frequently, because what would happen, I'd go to a city, people would, I think, like the class, and then recommend it to their friends. But if I wasn't coming back for six, nine, 12 months, the person would go take the friend would go take from somebody else. So I was kind of compressing my schedule and just going back to a smaller set of cities more frequently. And um, that was why I kind of cut down on some of the international stuff, unless I was trying to build up a presence in an area. I really didn't want to go there because unless I was going to go back four or five times, you go back multiple times a year. It just was impractical. Yeah. Um, what COVID did is um, we were actually very lucky. We do um, at least twice a year. We were getting together in person, all the people in my company, and we would we would set big goals for the next year. And we had done a meeting in December of 2019 in Santa Barbara, California and set our goals for 2020. And one of our goals was to do a non-certified course online um, and just see how that would go. Um, because I like the ability to deviate from some of the stuff that the Scrum Alliance mandates being a CSM course. And, you know, I mentioned earlier that I'm not just a Scrum guy. I want to teach other techniques. And so we were starting to go down that direction. I'd already had in January and February, I'd already had a couple of conversations with some um, university professors on how are you teaching online? What's the best mix? How are you assessing whether your students are learning, what's helping them learn. And so we had started to think about this, I hadn't really done much, but had been rolling around in my head quite a bit by the time COVID hit. Mm -hmm. And so we were started down this path. And then when COVID hit or shut everything down in early March, we were already a little bit planning for this. And so um, we switched our courses to where we do very much a hybrid model now where um, we do the live online stuff in Zoom, but if you think about any course, there's always a time when the when the teacher has to lecture, right? You know, mm -hmm. taking a class on math and it's in calculus, you're gonna solve calculus problems, but the teacher has to explain, you know, hey, here's how we do this, here's how you do the next step. And so what I had done in January and February is I recorded all of my classes. I wore a little mic while teaching, had all those transcribed, and then I was able to look at it and see where, where did I go five minutes or longer lecturing? And I took all of those little five minute things and turned them into videos. And so we, our courses now are videos where all the boring lecture, I'll call myself boring, <laughs> where all the boring yeah. lecture is pulled off into video and you can watch that whenever you want. And then that lets the live parts just be, um, uh, they're, if they're interactive, I mean, it's all exercises, it's all Q and A. So I talk a lot, but I'm not mm -hmm. having to lecture. I'm responding to a question, right? Yeah. And so we did that. We also hired, I think five trainers um, to deliver some of the courses um, because I'm really focused on using my time in a little bit more leveraged manner. And so I don't want to be teaching. I don't be teaching all the time. It'd be easy to fill up the courses with just me, but I don't, I didn't want to do that nonstop. Yeah. And uh, I, have you been surprised by how well the online training has been received or you just kind of given that you already tried that, uh, uh, I'm assuming that, you, that, that the feedback is positive because I think that's what a lot of trainers, including myself, are seeing. But uh, I'm not surprised surprise because well, yeah. no, I'm not surprised because we were starting to experience that already. Um, I had done something. I used to teach a course um, called Agile Estimating and Planning based on one of my books, and I would teach that in person. And then I moved it to be a pure video course, so no live element, just video. Um, and I did that oh, like eight or nine years ago. And when I did, I gave people a test at the end of that course, just a little optional test. Hey, you know, take this test if you want to help me out, see, let me see how the course is doing. And I gave it to, I don't know, four or five courses, four or five in-person groups and the first couple under through the videos. Um, and the people watching video did better on the test than people in the live sessions. Mm -hmm. And so I've always believed in the power of that. And part of it is that, in a video course, you can rewind, right? Something, I didn't get that, I, I wanna rewind, or I, I lost attention, my dog walked in the room and I lost attention for a second, let me rewind. 
And so it lets people rewind. It lets them rewind without having to ask the instructor, can, can you explain that better? Can you say that again? I didn't get that right. Cause people can get embarrassed by that. Exactly. And so we were seeing better educational outcomes with the video courses. Um, so when we moved to having a, a hybrid live online plus videos, I fully expected people to do very well with it. And um, we put a big investment into our, we built a platform for doing exercises in the course. Mm -hmm. And so we put quite a bit of money into that over the last year. And so that's really helped, but we're seeing people enjoy the courses quite a bit. So I'm happy about it. I'm not really surprised that it's worked out though. You've been a visionary. You've, you've uh, seen things before they come. At least that's how I see it. Uh, uh, what do you think uh, is going to be the next five years? Um, what is the balance between in-person um, uh, versus online? W what are your thoughts on what's coming? I wish I could say that I'm visionary. I don't know that I am. I think I've gotten lucky on a few different things, but um, you know, I've also been wrong about things, um, and those are not always the ones that people notice, right? Because <laughs> you know you're wrong, and yeah. you know it just doesn't stay. Um, so I've been wrong about plenty of things. Um, I think, I think as soon as companies get the chance, they're going to want people back in the office, um, and I think it's really great the stuff that we can do with video, but. Um, you know, the Zoom fatigue thing is real. Um, people do get tired um, of that. I mean, you know, as an example, you and I are making total eye contact right now. That's not normal, right? That's not normal, right? If we were in person, you would know that I'm paying attention, but I might be looking off to the side, just kind of looking at something, right? Yeah, yeah. And I notice when I do that, I have, a, I have kind of a nice view off to this side. This side's a bathroom. This side's a nice view. <laughs> and I'll yeah. be in a meeting with my team and I'll look off to the side like this and I realize I'm being really rude, right? They think I'm being rude. They think I'm not paying attention, right? Yeah. They think I'm watching TV or something and I'm watching The Bachelor. And <laughs> so I've had to, a couple of times in meetings say, I, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm listening to you. I'm thinking, I'm just kind of staring off into space for a second. Yeah. And so I think companies are going to be very eager to get people back into face-to-face -face things. I do think all the predictions about it being a hybrid world are going to be true, right? We're not necessarily going to make everybody come in every day, but I think companies are going to have people in, they'll be there for two or three days a week instead of the five days a week. Um, mm -hmm. Instead of the core hours idea that's been so popular at companies, I think we'll see more core days right? Look, can everybody come in on, on, you know, your team's all here on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, the other team is here on Thursday, Friday, or something like that, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. we're not overfilling the office. And I'm not about COVID stuff. I'm talking about, you know, shrinking office space. Shrinking office, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the offices will shrink. It'll be a little bit more for the hot desking or hoteling, it's called. And, um, but I think people are going to be back in there. Um, in terms of like what we do with travel and stuff like this, um, I think a lot of companies have learned that, um, the live online, the Zoom type classes work. Um, we're planning to do this. Like I said, in December of 19, we said we were doing this anyway, right? So yeah. I don't know that we would have done it, right? It was a goal. Would we have met our goal? I don't know. In yeah. March, we had to. Um, but I think that's going to continue. So I anticipate us having kind of a hybrid where we're able to do some live online courses um, and then some in-person courses. That's that's the future that we're preparing for, starting to think about you know, we have some little like internal bets, just me and some of my team, like, okay, when will we hold the first event? And, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. when will we first be back on an airplane, right? So we're taking a few internal bets on when we think that'll be. So what are you betting on? Like, when do you think we'll go back? I months, years? I think it's months. Um, yeah. I think we could do, um, I think I could right now do a in-person course in August. I think we could announce one for August. Um, and we're in March as we do this end of March, right? But I think it's going to be August that I could do a course. I don't think we're going to because of summer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I think, you know, if we just look kind of chronologically, I think that would work out. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think we will probably do a class in September or October in person. Yeah. Um, and the reason why we put it off a little bit is, you know, I, I, I can't do a course tomorrow. Maybe it's maybe everybody's healthy tomorrow. COVID's mm -hmm. vanished from the earth. I can't do a course tomorrow. Nobody knows about it, right? So, yeah. you know, we have to have a month or two to promote the course, get the hotel, all that type of stuff. So yeah. I think we're, we're going to feel comfortable in, in May or June booking an event, putting it out into September or October. So I fully expect we'll do something in person this year. Yeah, that's great. I mean, uh, I, I think uh, a lot of people are looking to uh, go back to some type of uh, normal. And I think that's a good indicator that uh, at least, you know, we're moving in, in, uh, in maybe in a better direction. Um, yeah, I think we are. Yeah. 
right? Uh, what are your thoughts on the current um, state of Agile? Obviously, with the anniversary, 20th anniversary of the Agile Manifesto, a lot of things have changed. A lot of things have not changed. Uh, what are the things that, uh, that you see uh, as far as the, you know, where Agile is from and that whole movement that I believe uh, you and your peers started? Uh, where, is it, where is it in 2021? I think well, I think you know. I think it's the the thing that we see that's obvious is that Agile's moving outside of software development and IT projects, right? And the whole business agility type of discussions. Um, as we do that, I think we see a, a watering down of what it means to be Agile, um, because I think Agile in a software development is we've got it pretty well figured out in terms of like you know here's the type of stuff you got to do. It's not easy to do, but we kind of know what you have to do to to be Agile, be flexible, to be nimble. Um, mm -hmm. And I think so. It's a hard set of things to do. Um, but to call ourselves an agile organization, what do we have to do? Um, and I think a lot of companies just look at that as like, you know, be more responsive to customers than we used to be, be faster than we used to be, and we're agile. Okay. And, you know, it's it just means be better to the, you know, business agile just means be better than we are. And it doesn't mean our, a core set of things. And as we've gone in that direction, um, I wonder about some of the stuff that are in things like the Scrum Guide and where the Scrum Guide has become less and less software focused or even product focused over the years. And, um, you know, that's fine. I understand it. And I probably would make the same decisions with that. But, um, I mean, I'm a software guy, right? We just talked about my first books were on software. My company name has software in the in the company name. Right. And um, so I'm a software guy. And um, I think of groups like the Project Management Institute, and I don't want to put them down. This isn't what that's about. But I think about the PMI and their, their project management professional thing, right? They're going to teach people how to manage any project in the world, right? I'm going to die happy if I know how to manage software projects well, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not that ambitious to manage every type of project in the world, right? I mean, I, I go on like a, a drive and I'll drive through a city where there's a lot of construction going on or an airport's a really good example when the airport is, you know, adding a new runway and they have to close all the other stuff and all the trucks have to go a different way. And I'm, I always look at that. It's like, how did they figure that out, right? How did they figure out where to route the trucks? And, you know, I can't, I can't visualize that stuff very well. And so, I just want to perfect managing software projects, right? And when we see things like PMP, project managed professional, be manage everything, or we see agile going to be agile and everything, it's like, wow, that's awfully ambitious. I don't know that that I'm up for. I'm not up for that. I mean, I'll, I'll help companies become more agile, but um, that's a really tough challenge, and it gets watered down sometimes. What agile means gets watered down when we do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's almost, in, uh, you know, I talked about Scrum as being a recipe and everybody wants to take that recipe, uh, but they don't have the ingredients. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah. it's challenging, uh, but it's interesting. I'm seeing uh, there's a company in California uh, called Clark Pacific um, that are applying lean and agile to construction. And they're one of the biggest mm -hmm. companies in um, California. And recently I hosted uh, their product owner uh, just to share what they're doing. And I think... There's a lot of benefit, although uh, it's not software development, but just the aspects of uh, agile principles like visualizing, interaction, yep. clarifying things. I think a lot of that could be applied in you know other industries. So it is. Oh, ab I'm absolutely. More and more, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. But here's what happens: we apply it in those other areas within a company, and then the software group sees that and says, "Oh, that's what agile is." And all of a sudden, the software group doesn't have to go to the same extent that we're talking about today, right? Mm -hmm. Because they see, oh, that's enough to call ourselves agile. And so we water it down a little bit. I'm not saying it's bad, right? But we water it down because it cannot be as rigid in things that are as um, hard, that are harder to change, right? Software's mm -hmm. it's software. It's easy to change, right? When we go into construction, we have to water agile down a little bit, right? It cannot be, you know, a nightly build of your building. You know, you're not going to have those <laughs> concepts. Yeah. And so it gets watered down, software teams see that, and then they water it down. All of a sudden, the software teams are not as agile as we might have pushed them to be today. So mm -hmm. that's the part that I worry about it as we broaden it out. I worry what it does to the software teams. To the software teams, yeah. That's a really yeah. good point. I haven't, uh, I haven't thought about it, you know, from that perspective. Because in general, it's good. It's getting, you know, broader uh, and mm -hmm. people are applying it, but it's also getting watered down. Um, what is your uh, take on the scaling of agile 
Um, I don't think I've ever heard you speak on that. Uh, it will be interesting to hear your thoughts on scaling. Yeah, it's not my thing. Um, you know, I think what happened is, I don't know when it started, but it's probably seven or eight years ago, people started to see, you know, consultants like me saw, ooh, there's money in bigger contracts. Let me go after the big companies. What do the bigger companies need? They need to know how to scale. And so yeah. we started to see a proliferation of scaling frameworks. Um, you know, ooh, there's money there. Let me let me do this. And mm -hmm. some of them are good. They're, they all have some good to them, um, but some of them are more empirical, right? They were derived from things that worked. Others were created by somebody who sat around in a in a quiet room and said, "Hey, here's what teams should do. Let me just make up some some practices that I've seen, and let me pretend they all go together." Mm -hmm. And um, it's just, it's not my thing. One of the things that I feel very fortunate about is having been early into this, I get to pick and choose a little bit more who I work with. I get to be more selective. I'm never, never like desperate for work that I have to say yes to every client. And so mm -hmm. I do a little bit more focus on software projects, right? I mean, I hope I will help non-software teams, but a little bit more of my focus. And I'm much more interested in helping, not, I don't want to say small projects, but I'm not interested in the 500 or 700 person project because I look at that and go, mm -hmm. you probably shouldn't be that big, right? Yeah. And so I like the projects that are more like 100 people or smaller um, because those I can go into those and I can make them dramatically better. Yeah. I can go into a, a 700 person project and get them to the point where they're as productive as a 100 person team would have been. And that's not a very good place to be, right? <laughs> uh, so I get much more interested in in kind of small scale scrum rather than large scale scrum, right? How can we help, you know, small sets of teams collaborate? So I definitely do stuff with scaling, but it's more kind of scaling across 50 or 100 people. Or more like descaling, right? Rather than scaling. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you always want to see, you know, how much can we do with, uh, you know, with fewer people, right? You know, can we can we be better? And there are studies that show that we can. I mean, there's studies that um, there was one study in particular by um, Doug Putnam that showed that the most productive teams were um, five people. Um, and I don't mean most productive per person, most productive. So a five person team was outperforming a seven or eight person team. And again, not per person, but in total. And so what can we do to coordinate the work of a bunch of five person teams to to get a lot of stuff done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and I think that's another thing that the or topic that's being diluted and there's more, there's more scaling frameworks, there's more approaches, everybody's pushing for their own uh, kind of recipe. And that's creating a lot of chaos in organizations as well, because uh, one of the things that I'm seeing is leaders are not educated uh, right. or don't have the time to learn so they rely on consultants, but if we have a buy-in of like, this is why I'm recommending this framework versus that framework, um, they blindly go with what somebody recommends rather than understanding it. Um, well, it leads to methodology worship. And this kind of fits in with something that a guy named Ivar Jakobsen is doing. He's the inventor of use cases originally, and yeah. it does uh, essence these days with a kind of a approach to communicating about agility is how I describe it. And he has a bunch of talks that he calls, I think they're called free the practices. Basically get rid of all the methodologies. There's just a collection of practices and go assemble them the way you wanna do. And mm -hmm. that's very aligned to how I've talked about Agile for probably a decade. I remember giving a keynote talk at a conference about a decade ago and talking about how I wanted to kind of make a list of all the practices out there. And then, you know, just picture it's a whole bunch of practice and then circle like these 20 and say, that's what you do if you're scaling, circle these 20, and that's what you do if you're a pharmaceutical company, circle these 12, that's what you do if you're a game studio. And so I was kind of looking to use the term patterns a moment ago, right? I want to figure out all those practices and then certain groupings are good if you're this type of company or that type of company. And we shouldn't all be doing the same thing, right? We don't want everybody in the world doing the exact same methodology or process. Exactly. But there is, there's so much demand for, like that's why, you know, certain frameworks are more popular than others because, hey, it creates sense of safety. I can just change some things and, uh, um, and uh, you know, make it look like we're doing Agile. And there's a lot of focus on doing <laughs> Agile versus being Agile. And what are the things that you do, for instance, when you go in, when you're coaching or consulting uh, to help leaders um, understand the importance of them understanding these things, not just relying on consultants. Uh, I, I call it like, it's almost like bringing in a chef to tell you what to do, but your ingredients keep changing. <laughs> so eventually you're <laughs> gonna develop your own uh, uh, own chefs. 
right? Or cooks or, so, you know, you can't just rely on recipes. What, uh, one of the things that I do with executives is I try to, I try to scare them. I try to make them, I try to explain how hard agile is going to be, right? Everybody goes and wants to sell the benefits. And what I've learned works really well with kind of the executive audience is to go in and just tell them, you know, Agile's great. You're going to get some benefits. I'll touch, start with those. But then I start to talk about all the hard things they're going to do and yeah. tell them, I tell them why they're not up for it. You know, you, you know, but uh, you'd have to do this. And, you know, that's going to be really hard in your culture. You're not going to be able to do this. And, um, you know, it's going to be tough. I'm not sure if you can do this here. I'm not sure if you really want to commit to this. And what I find when I do that is if they argue back with me and say, no, we are willing to do that. Now I've got them hooked and they're willing to make the hard change. But if I just go out there and I say, look, you're probably not going to be committed to this. I don't know that I would do this if I were you. If they go, yeah, you're right. I just saved them a ton of money with a failed transition, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, heartbreak and loss of time and all sorts of stuff. And here's why I started doing that. I started thinking about it was some movie I was watching. I don't remember what movie it was, but it was one of those typical like romantic comedy movies, you know, romance. Yeah. And um, I don't remember who it was, but you know, the 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 girl breaks up with the guy. The guy was gonna break up with the girl anyway, but she breaks up with him. And as soon as she breaks up with him, now he wants her, right? You know, and I mean, you know, that's just that's just like human nature. You know, you dumped me, now I want you back. And um, I know that from a personal experience. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I, th I think we all can relate to it to some extent, yeah. right? And so th it's the same thing with Agile. You, you go in and you tell the company, why, you know, you're not right for Agile. If they start arguing, yes, they are, okay. Now, now you've got one where it's going to be successful. And um, they're going to do the hard work. They're going to do what needs to be done to, to make the change. They're not just going to, oh, let's just hire some consultants and all of a sudden we'll be Agile. We don't have to do anything. They're Agile. No, you got to do stuff too. And here's the hard things you have to do. Yeah. And I think uh, I spoke with Dave Snowden two weeks ago, I think. And uh, mm -hmm. we talked about like big consulting companies and, you know, them coming in, sell selling the playbooks, do doing, you know, and I asked him, you know, he's been around for a while too. And uh, like, you know, what, what his thoughts were on the uh, big consulting companies. We saw, you know, what, what's happening with agile companies and everybody wants to now jump on the agile and scrum mm -hmm. bang, uh, um, bandwagon. Uh, what are your thoughts as far as like, what is the future of consulting coaching? Do you think it's gonna be more of smaller companies partnering or do you think, that the big uh, consulting companies will keep doing what they're doing. Um, oh, I think there'll always be room for independent consultants, boutique consultancies. Um, that's not gonna, that's never gonna go away. But what I think will go away, um, and I to some extent hope goes away, is the emphasis on agile, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, at some point we just want this to be what people do. We don't have to keep harping on being agile. Of course we should be agile, right? You know, imagine, you know, your whole thing is you're a consultant and you tell companies they have to be profitable. You need to make a profit, right? And you're like, yeah, of course we do, right? And so I want Agile to get into that category where you're saying you got to be Agile. I'm like, yeah, of course, right? We're working on that. And um, so at that point, I don't think anybody's going to be making any significant money from Agile, whether they're, you know, a, a big consultancy, a, you know, Bain, Boston, anybody like that, Accenture, or if they're you know, small companies like mine are independent consultants. There's not going to be money in helping somebody be agile. It's going to be like, of course, and we have, and we have 300 people who've been agile before, right? You know, we've mm -hmm. hired over the last 10 years, 300 people that from various companies, we know how to be agile. And um, so I'll always be kind of a cultural fight. You know, you're always going to be fighting to be more profitable. You're always going to be fighting to be more agile, but you're not going to be bringing in consultants just for that. So I think that's going to, I mean, I don't even think that. I know that. That's not even a guess. That's a guarantee, right? Yeah. How many people are out there right now making money teaching object-oriented design, right? Yeah. Compared to how many there were in the 90s, right? You know, it's going to go away. There will be some, there's always some need for some of that. And um, but I don't think it just gets swallowed up by big. I think it just gets, it just becomes how we do becomes, things at yeah. some point. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how soon that happens. Have, uh, that's why I started this and I called it agile to agility because the agility is, is the goal, right? The agile goal. just means to, 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 to the end, uh, or means to an end. Um, great. Um, what are your thoughts, um, around, uh, culture like what's what's like a lot of times you know we talk about culture and mindset are about being agile 
Um, how do you define culture? And uh, is culture something that you change or is, do you think it's something that's more like a um, shadow or reflection of something you do? I don't, I mean, I think we're playing semantic games when I say it this way. I don't know that we can change culture, but we can evolve culture, right? Okay. You know, you know, I can, I can decide to go keto tomorrow and all of a sudden I'm just eating protein, right? I mean, that's a change and I can do that overnight. I can't decide, okay, tomorrow I'm agile. I'm a big company tomorrow, I'm agile, right? But I can evolve my culture as a big company, a small company, I can evolve the culture. And so, you know, that's kind of your point about, you know, moving from agile to agility. And so I can evolve the culture to be amenable to agile. I don't think I can go in and just no company, no consultant can just go in and just change it. Um, it has to be a longer term commitment. It has to evolve over years, even to, mm -hmm. to really get to where we want to be. Um, I don't know exactly how I would define culture. My, my initial thought now, this is probably from somewhere else is that it's kind of like how people in that company behave when they're not getting evaluated, honored or watched or something like that. You know, you know, is our culture customer centric? And will I do the right thing for our customers? Even my boss will never know I did the right thing for the customer. Um, as a little example on that, we had a, um, my wife and I bought a new refri a new um, dishwasher and we had it installed. It took like, you know, a month to get it. And the guy came out, installed it and took a couple hours, got the thing installed. And then um, that night it wouldn't start. He started it as a test, showed my wife how to start it. And then that night we went to start the thing and it wouldn't start. Um, it was like 6.30 at night. And we called the store just expecting, the appliance store just expecting to leave a message we got the salesperson, not the one who sold it to us, and he came out to our house. Right That night, he came out to our house and fixed it. And his boss, unless we tell his boss, was never going to know never that. Never going to know, yeah. Never going to know. I mean, he just, you know, he said, oh, you guys are on my way home. I live in that city. And we're about 10 miles from the store. And yeah. he stopped on his way home and fixed that. Um, I made sure to, you know, send something to the company, letting them know. Yeah. But that guy did the right thing with no expectation that his boss would ever know. That's an amazing culture, right? When mm. you know you can say you're customer centric, or whatever, but that's a company that was living it. Yeah. So yeah, that's a, that's a really good example, and you know that. I mean, we all experience that type of either you've done it or somebody has done it some at some point in your life where you know that they're really looking for your best interest and they want to make sure that you're satisfied as a customer. Um, yeah. And that, that those type of cultures and organizations are the one that I think that are resilient and that. Uh, keep people and people want to be there. I mean, you know, you, you're familiar with the numbers as far as how many people are disengaged at work. Oh, yeah. And, uh, it, you know, <laughs> they're very high. So um, when it comes to mindset, uh, how, you know, we talk also in agile communities, change the mindset, change the culture. Um, what are your thoughts on mindset similar to culture? Because I see those as being agile more than doing agile. Yeah, I think the mindset is what drives the culture. They go hand in hand, right? You have to have the right mindset, um, the right mindset, the right values to create the culture. So I think the culture comes as a result of having the, a proper mindset. And um, I think one of the things I encounter with that is a lot of times it's, um, it, it come, again, it comes from the values, but it's like we value predictability over all else. Right. And so I see a lot of estimating problems, got a real book on it. Right. And so to be, you know, a company that values predictability over all else, well, they're going to be predictable by going slow. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you and I scheduled a webinar or, or interview here. And, you know, if I had asked you how long and you said, well, I want to be safe, let me tell Mike six hours. Right. We'll, we'll be on the phone for less than six hours. Right. That would have been really safe. I can't imagine you interviewing anybody for, for six hours. Right. Exactly. And you'd have 100 percent success rate. Right. You know, mm -hmm. versus if you told people half hours, like, okay, sometimes you go over, sometimes you don't. And so the companies that value the predictability, people are going to behave that way. They're going to give padded big estimates and um, it creates a, a culture where we don't want to be honest, a culture where we don't trust each other. And that leads to all sorts of problems on teams. So I think it's values to mindset to culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's how I see it too. And uh, th that's important. And uh, I think the agile community and scrum community are getting more of that. And I'm seeing that more in, in, uh, in trainings, more in coaching. And uh, I, I feel like that that's the next step where we need to better understand as a community and help the clients. 
Um, well, it's an interesting, it's an interesting si- situation. It goes back to our very early discussion. We we're talking about the beginnings of Agile. Um, mm-hmm. I remember at the early Agile conferences, this was about like 2003, 4, 5, there was a lot of what I considered karate kid conversations, right? Yeah. Can you be Agile if you just do the practices? You don't know the values of Agile, but you do daily stand-ups. You integrate off and you test like crazy. You do all these things. Can you be Agile? And that'd be a, you know, a wax on type of thing, right? I'm just yeah. going through the motions. <laughs> And there were arguments, can you learn to be agile if you just go through the motions long enough, right? Mm-hmm. And I don't know, those debates, I don't hear them anymore. But I mean, that was every conference you would go to in the early days, that values versus practices, principles versus practices, huge conversation, huge debate at every, every agile conference. 